Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining in and signing in today uh, for a conversation. I'm very excited today. Uh, I will be your host. And as an introduction, I am Shiv Seigel, Head of Institutional Securities, Edelweiss Wealth Management. And today we have the honor uh, for having uh, Dr. Mark Faber amongst us. Not that he needs an introduction, uh, but I would love to give a small brief on him. Uh, Dr. Mark Faber is a market veteran and investor who have, I've had the privilege of following his career as well. And he's the publisher and editor of the Gloom and Boom, <coughs> Gloom, Boom and Doom report, uh, the newsletter which highlights unusual investment opportunities. And uh, in my previous aftas, I've been an avid reader of his newsletter as well. Uh, Mark, for the uninitiated and unknown, is a world-class economic historian and famous for his controlling approach to investing. Mark has uh, steered his own course through the mainstream of international finance markets. Uh, I would say he is chartered un <clears throat> uncharted waters. In 1987, he warned his clients to cash out before the Black Monday in Wall Street. Uh, he made them handsome profits by forecasting the burst in the Japanese bubble in the 1990s. He correctly predicted the collapse in U.S. gaming stocks in 1993. And he, of course, foresaw the Asia-Pacific crisis of 1997-98 and the resulting global volatility. He's also the author of several uh, books, uh, particularly the one that I'm holding right in my hand right now. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow's Gold, the Asia's Age of Discovery. That's the actual original edition. I've you know, highlighted uh, points as I've read the book. I would have got it signed if this was a... Uh, in-person meeting. Uh, today, he will share his expertise and knowledge, uh, you know, on, on macro and emerging markets. And, uh, you know, he's a frequent media appearance on, on Bloomberg and CNBC. <laughs> today, we have the privilege of having him on the Edelweiss platform. And uh, again, you know, without taking too much time uh, on just an introduction, Mark, it's a pleasure to have you and a very warm welcome from my side. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm familiar with you and your company, and I greatly admire uh, your company and India's success in the last few years. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. So, you know, just before I get into the nitty gritties of, you know, what's happening in the world, uh, and it's been a volatile day in India as well. You know, we just had uh, a 40 bips increase in, in rates in India. And of course, the Fed is probably going to raise rates, uh, you know, market is pricing in 50 bips. But before I get into the narrative there, I actually thought we'll start off with something more softer. You know, I, as I said, I have avidly followed you, uh, you know, from your entry into the finance world in the 1980s and, uh, you know, your foray into a contrarian investor. You always bring out very interesting anecdotes from history perspective. You're a very avid reader, reader, of, reader, of, reader, of, reader of economics as well. And uh, just your thought today as we stand, you know, I mean, from when you entered the world of finance to today, you know, there is probably an overload of information and the dissemination of information <laughs> so fast, um, and the inefficiencies that probably existed, you know, in Asia in you know, the early days when you moved here, uh, where do you see the biggest changes happened uh, in terms of, you know, where markets stand today, where they were probably, a, a, you know, two decades or maybe a decade back as well. Uh, just some thoughts and, you know, what, where, where your journey has been in finance before we get into, you know, more serious questions? Well, I think uh, there are two or three different aspects to the current situation. First of all, I really feel that if someone starts out in whatever business today, it's very important to understand that we are at the milestone of history. Uh, it's not the milestone that occurred in the day or in a week or so. But basically, what has happened, uh, as you know, India was a very powerful and rich country, say, around a thousand years ago. And uh, southern India is one of the few countries that was never invaded by anyone. So it must have been very powerful, and even Alexander the Great and the Mongols, they didn't dare to go into southern India because the cost have been, would have been too high. And after that, uh, through mostly internal strife, and we have to realize most empires decline not because of foreign enemies, but because of internal strife. Uh, the struggle. Usually, one of the big problems of any empire 
is succession. The Ottoman Empire uh, solved this problem by having one ruler and killing all the other children, his brothers. <laughs> so they were eliminated right away when he became the Sultan. Anyway, but the Mongols had similar problems. And today we have had over the last 150 years a relative decline of India and China and other emerging economies under the dominance of Western imperialism and colonialism. Not everything that colonialism did was bad, but it kept these countries down to some extent. And then came communism. And now these systems are over and we have a rise especially of Asia, but also of other regions in the world, also population-wise. You know, you look at Britain. Recently, the clown Boris was in India. It's a small, irrelevant country today, Great Britain. has nothing to do in the world anymore. But it was once the ruler of India. And that time is over, and it will never come back. Only Western arrogant leaders, because of their domestic failures, they want still to show at home that they can achieve some diplomatic uh, kind of victories or new alliances. But the fact is, Asia, Latin America, Central Asia, and so forth, they don't listen anymore to the Western world. And this change, this rise of new countries, and the relative decline of the Western alliance under the hegemony of the US is going down. And this shift in economic power is a very powerful trend. Of course, it is resisted by the US because they would like to have world dominance with all their nonsense theories about culture and racism and so forth. But this is over. And they are resisting it, and so it come, it get, it, they are struggling, essentially, both economically, they are, there is a trade war in the world, and there's now a war in Ukraine. And uh, what it means is times are uh, very exciting for opportunities. And I think uh, that for India, this is a great opportunity, incidentally. Number two, financially, you understand, I was born in 1946, just after the war. I'm a so-called lucky boomer. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we had a life where, because of World War I and World War II, as children, uh, we were told to work hard and save money and so forth. And I do not recall any discussion about investments uh, until I was maybe around 20 years old. It was never talked about in my grandparents' house or in my parents' house about money and what you could do and stocks and this. And that. It's only when I was like 18, 20 that I started to look at stocks. And this is different because of this neglecting of uh, neglect of uh, financial affairs stocks and real estate in the 1950s and 60s were inexpensive compared to wages so to put it simply the dow jones and the us market capitalization as a percent of the economy were low in the 70s uh, the market capitalization of the U.S., the entire market, was uh, just 30%, 25% of GDP. Now it went to 250%. Yep. IBM alone. The market value of IBM alone in 1970 was higher than the entire Japanese stock market. 1970. 1989... In other words, 20 years later, the Japanese stock market was more than 50% of the world's stock market capitalization. So we have huge changes. 
And now we have essentially a financialized world. The GDP of the world is this big, and the financial market is this big. So this is the, the real economy. What you do, what your staff does, what your employees, what the farmer in India does has no impact on the world. But this, the financial market, has an impact. And this financial market is in a bubble stage, both bonds and stocks. Now, uh, we have had very good times. You know, if you invested in the Dow Jones in 1980, the Dow was at the less than 800. And now it is over 30,000. So we had a wonderful time of asset inflation. This creates the monetary, the money illusion, according to economist Irving Fisher. This money illusion makes people feel rich. They spend and go and this and that, and they think it will go on forever. I think we are at the turning point where asset markets will perform badly. Now, the strategy in this view, the world view, is how do I lose the least money? Yep. I know how to lose the least money. I gave my money to Edelweiss for management. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's a very kind enough of you. So Mark, you know, like, let me come to your gloom. Boom and do trust. It. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, you know, when you look at the gloom, boom, boom, doom scenario, it seems to me that uh, absolutely you feel that there is, you know, been a massive asset reflation uh, in the world. Uh, but to be a successful contrarian, right, you need to know what you're contrary about, right? And I think all the listeners joining in would love to know what Mark already knows. So, you know, what has been your investment strategy in the past one year? Where do you see in an inflated world pockets that are still interesting to you? Uh, so I guess, you know, in summary, the question that I'm asking is, where do you see the best benefit in the next, you know, near term future in financial markets? Yes, you see the U.S. markets have definitely kind of, you know, in a bubble territory. But do you think, uh, given the, you know, carnage in, in Asia, especially in China, uh, does China become a value proposition? Or, the, you know, a lot, a lot has been talked about the fact that, you know, India has held up very relatively much well in terms of EMs. Uh, do you think that this continues, uh, the Indian outperformance continues this decade? Or how do you see the world from that perspective at the moment? Well, I think that the bubble has created some unusual opportunities in the sense uh, that, and you know this because you run money and you have fund managers. In order to succeed in your business, it is important to attract new clients. So one of the objectives is to outperform the index. Because if you underperform the index, uh, people will ask, well, why would I invest with you? You're underperforming the index for three years and so forth. And so the industry was focused on just one thing. How do I outperform the index? Right. But you outperform the index in going into fashionable investments. So for the last two years, you look at, say, the U.S. market was was uh, fashionable. Bitcoins, and it was meme stocks, you know, GameStop and AMC and so forth. A lot of worthless companies, but because they were written up in Reddit and because never before in history have we had so many young investors. These are all geniuses in the eyes of their parents. They don't, they're so clever, they don't need to work. The parents just give them some money and say, oh, you trade for us. <laughs> and so forth. at the beginning, they were successful. And all these geniuses have no experience. I'm not saying they're dumb, but they got the money and they could trade without any experience that markets go up and they go down. And then came the SPACs, S-P-A-Cs. And there was a fellow in America, Pachavala or whatever his name is, <laughs> kind of promoted that without an end. 
And then came people like Cathy Wood of ARC Innovation and promoted that without any end. And uh, young people, they followed these prophets <laughs> and these new religious leaders. They were all dancing around the golden calf of prophets and greed. And that then collapsed, okay? So the ARC, which was one of the largest and most successful funds in the US, since uh, the beginning of February 2021, now, in other words, more than a year ago, it's down 68%, 6 8. One of your friends, I mean, of our friends, whether you know him or not, is not important. There's Tiger Fund uh, by Coleman. Yes. It was down this year, I don't know, like 40% or down 50% from the high. You know, this was one of the geniuses that wanted to perform better than the index in order to get more money. And within half a year, he's down 50%. Absolutely. No, so exactly. I think we have to look at uh, the world and say, okay, geopolitically, it looks bad. There will be tensions. You look at just recently India, the foreign minister, he rightly said, with China, they made a security pact with the Solomon Islands. <laughs> the Solomon Islands is... <laughs> a little island uh, colony they have a thousand islands completely irrelevant except the shipping lanes between australia the east coast and china goes through the solomon islands one of the islands was the, the site of big fighting in the second world war guadacanal <laughs> very heavy fighting between the japanese and the US. Anyway, the Chinese made the security agreement and immediately the, the Australians and the US and the UK, they say it's an aggression against us. Correct. The Indian foreign ministry, for the first time, I've never seen this in my life before, the Indian foreign minister, he defended actually China. I've never seen India defend China in any way. But he said they are entitled to have a security pact with a sovereign nation. You also have security pact. You actually provoked the action by forming this Auktum in Asia, which is a pact to deliver nuclear submarines to Australia in order to kind of control the area. That is an aggression against China, not vice versa. So you understand we are in a new world and India, they stayed out of sanctioning Russia, rightly so, because they say, well, the, you know, we don't know the conditions very well. NATO clearly provoked Putin. He clearly outlined, I want a neutral state, a buffer state between NATO countries and Russia. Right. But they disre disregard this. So do you think, given what's happening geopolitically and the war in, you know, Eastern Europe, uh, <coughs> and, you know, we have also come out of a period for the last, I would say, you know, two decades, where from 2004, with the China machinery working very well, that there was a globalization process, right? And now in the last two years with the pandemic hitting, um, and, you know, most countries wanting to become self-reliant, you know, in India, we're talking about the China plus one manufacturing theme picking up in big time. Do you feel that there is a deacceleration in globalization and, you know, this individualistic country becoming, you know, more dependent on supply chains, logistically uh, having access to most of your raw materials is going to be the theme that plays out, you know, in the next 10 years? Uh, is that something that you're focused on from a, from a global perspective? Well, the thing is this, global trade as a percent of global GDP expanded very rapidly since 1982 until 2015, when it started to decline, not absolutely, but relative to global GDP. Now, last three months, global trade has declined absolutely in uh, nominal terms. And I believe 
you know, is people frequently ask me, where should I buy real estate? I believe we live in a world where you will feel safer to have a house in the countryside than in a big city. I think uh, we have now these disruptions of supplies, of resources. O Australia doesn't want to sell bauxite to Russia. Russia curtails the exports of certain goods to uh, the Western countries. And China, <laughs> they locked down, in my opinion, if you look at the Chinese lockdowns in Shanghai and other cities, there was no necessity, economically speaking, to do it. China did it for another reason. There's nothing in politics that happened without a reason. In my view, it was to show to the Western world, you know, you want to mess with us? We can also show you that if we shut down our economy, you have no spare parts. That and so I believe that globally, the trend will be self-sufficiency. Yep. You know, you as a household, say if you live in Delhi or in Mumbai in the center, you depend on water supplies, you depend on food coming into the city, on the delivery of food, on the retailers and so forth. If you live in the countryside and you have a piece of land like I have, I can keep some cows <laughs> and some chicken <laughs> and, some, and some grow some rice. So I, I could be self-sufficient. Of course, I depend on electricity for talking to you, but I can live without electricity in theory, but I can't live without water. I can't live without food. So these are things that well-to-do people around the world are seriously thinking about. And countries, they think about the same thing. Now in Europe, they have the pipe dream to become energy independent from Russia. <laughs> this, it, it is possible, but look at the cost. What will it cost? They're destroying their economies. It will increase the rate of inflation dramatically. So I think for the world, it would be better to be peaceful <laughs> with each other you know, and trade. Global trade, as you know, is beneficial. Yeah. Now, if someone comes to me and says, well, you know, global trade has hurt me because there's competition and so forth, that undoubtedly, but for global growth, and if you look at the world today, never before has the distance between poor countries and rich countries narrowed so much and the poverty rate, as you know, in India and in China. And in Africa, we had droughts and we had uh, people going hungry and we had famines. Nowadays, most people are no longer hungry. The standard of living of most people in the world has never been this high as it is now, thanks to capitalism and free markets. But equally, we have to see that there's large wealth differences, Mr. Aban, Ambahami, he lives differently than say the poorest India, Indian. But he goes and for his children, he may buy a McDonald's, which the poorest Indian can also buy. So the poorest guy in the world, he can eat the same McDonald's and he can eat, drink the same Coca-Cola as Warren Buffett, <laughs> and Elon Musk and so forth. Well, this has never been before like this. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the access... This, uh, this people don't see, but I can see it. Uh, I'm not saying that the world is a just and fair place. Justice, uh, as you know, in the major religion, religions is not uh, achieved here on this, in this world or it is achieved in spiritual matters, but not in monetary matters. Uh, so we have this uh, wealth inequality, 
But here, and we have to discuss this, the wealth inequality has been uh, essentially enabled and promoted by central bankers. You understand, you were born, say, you look young, you were born 25 years ago. I look a little bit older, I was born 35 years ago. So let's say we had parents, they had a piece of land. Our friend at school, he had parents, he had no piece of land. Then the, the Fed prints money, our piece of land goes up a lot in value, and we become rich. And our school friend, he has a much harder life to get to where we are. So the central banks have created this wealth inequality, and they continue to create it. Now they are in a difficult position, because if they print money, inflation will go up. Then you have social discontent, because as long as inflation is only in stocks and real estate and bonds and collectibles, everything is okay. But if inflation goes up for consumer goods, for food, the housewives, all the women in the world, they rebel. Oh, the price of chicken is going up, the price of wheat <laughs> and so forth. And then they threaten to cut off the throats of their husbands and the husbands then rebel politically. <laughs> well, my, you that's know, that's we, how we, the world works. The no, women always rule. No, that there is no denying in that statement. Uh, we all know who's the boss of the house. Um, you know, <laughs> the world has come a full circle, you know, the way I look at it. You know, when COVID struck two years back, uh, there was no doubt everyone was talking about deflation. And, you know, it was a very different world. Uh, just the, you know, the statement that you just made, the central banks have been pumping in so much liquidity. And we are now facing a very, very aggressive uh, inflation prints for the last six, nine months world over. The Fed also changed its stance from being transitory uh, to, you know, inflation being a lot more sticky. And uh, we have just seen India raise rates today. The Fed is, as I mentioned, is probably going to raise rates by 50 bips tonight. Uh, but do you think that the Fed narrative will play out? Because if I look at the Fed probabilities, what the market is pricing in, we are pricing in 50 bips today. We are pricing in a 75 bips rate hike by the next Fed meeting and another 50 bips uh, post uh, the second meeting of the Fed. But do you think if the if the rate hikes are that excessive and given the global debt in the in the system, uh, will one the Fed be able to walk the talk, or two, uh, I think even before raising rate hikes, you know there has been enough uh, carnage in the in the financial assets world as you just mentioned, <laughs> right? I mean, Ark is down, uh, most of the tech stocks are down, the Fangs are down. You know we have lost. Um, you know cumulatively, I just checked. The five trillion dollars have been shaved off the market uh, in in terms of uh, market cap in the last you know four five weeks. So, do you think that the inflation narrative probably has peaked out? And as the central banks talked about you know raising rates, that we now see global growth weaning off so much that in another two three months time, once more data is out, that you know they will probably scale back the aggressive narrative and we'll be back in a world where, as you just mentioned. <laughs> that they have to kick the can down the road more and more aggressively. Is that how you see the world playing out? Uh, I think this is a very good question. And it is on most people's mind who are involved in asset markets, whether you are a bond trader or a stock investor or investor in properties and so forth. Uh, Earlier on, I said to you that the global economy is this big and the financial market this big and asset markets. Now, the Fed is in a very difficult position because if they decide to increase rates much more and this deflates, during the period of inflation, it had a good impact on the real economy. When this collapses, when this goes down, as you said, the five trillion dollars have been lost. And that will have an impact, in my opinion. I think, quite frankly, the global economy today is already in recession. 
Now, the governments will not say so, but you go to ordinary people, and uh, I know academics and so forth, they don't interest me. What interests me is the life of ordinary people. But I can see their incomes are down or flat. Now, some statistically, some people say, well, our wages go up, but they go up less than the price increases for food and energy and transportation and insurance premiums and so forth, and taxes. The European governments, the US government, will always increase taxes, not on the super rich, but on ordinary people. So anyway, I think the Fed, they will use an excuse at some point not to increase rates further. They will say, well, you know, if we increase rates, the economic damage is too big. And we have these problems. Why? Because of Putin. <laughs> yeah, sure. And we had them before because of COVID. And now it's Putin. And they find another excuse somewhere. They, in my opinion, the Fed will increase the Fed fund rate. And I have to point out to your viewers, never in history have interest rates in the Western world been this low, including Japan. This is in 5,000 years of human history, interest rates have never been this low. And why were they this low? Because of central bank manipulation. And now, you know, I'm a friend with John Taylor of Stanford. He established the Taylor rule for interest rates. According to him, the Taylor, according to the Taylor rule, interest rates, the Fed fund rate should be at 9.81%. Oh. And it's at zero. And Lagarde in Europe, she says, oh, inflation is transitory and so forth. I mean, the they're horrible. These people are destroying the middle class and the lower classes. But this is throughout history always been the case. Uh, you protect the aristocracy. Today we don't have an elegant aristocracy. We don't have the Marahachas that are cult were cultured people. We don't have the feudals of Europe that were intelligent and cultured. But we have just simple uh, wealthy people that became rich because of speculation and money printing. So Mark, you know, and the next follow on question that is probably more obvious is the one that, you know, there is a constant debate in the macro circles about uh, the US dollar being the global reserve uh, uh, as, as you know, under threat. So the question I have for you is right, you know, if that is the view that is getting formed in most of the macro circles, and we here we have, uh, for obvious reasons, given what has happened geopolitics, the euro kind of you know uh, under uh, you know has been <clears throat> diminishing. Uh, we have seen the yen go from 105 to almost 131. The weakness there is you know quite ferocious last month itself. Um, and there is you know basically no other alternative the way I look at it in to to the US dollar. So there is no no competent currency that could put it at at a, a significant amount of risk, right? So how do you see that narrative play out? Do you feel that given that the world, the world, if you know, if the world uh, debtor economy, the way I look at it, you know, they are in short supply because the USD is the, is the FX reserve currency of the world, right? When things turn ugly, the US dollar rallies, right? So if there is a global recession about to happen uh, and we are seeing the strength in the USD in the last couple of weeks as well, how does that narrative play out? In the next, and I'm, and you know, it's the question is not about in the near term. You know, I'm looking out the next one, two, three years, and I kind of constantly debate that in my head, that for all bread and purposes, gold should be going up, and the U.S. dollar should be far more weaker, given the amount of you know global printing that's happened. But the narrative didn't play out, right? I mean, in 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 hindsight, two years down the line, we have the U.S. dollar still more stronger. So, what do you think is at play here? You know, where where in that thesis? Uh, is the thought process wrong or do you think that this is a blip and you know if we were to kind of have a crystal ball and you know walk into the future 12 months you know one or, one or two years down the line we would see a significantly weaker usd how do you see it in in your world i have to go and get my crystal ball 
<laughs> no, look, I mean, I always say currencies is the most difficult to predict. I don't know anyone who's been always right on currencies. I know lots of people who've been relatively right about stocks. But on currencies, is very interesting. When you think about it, this year, the Japanese yen is down 11% against the US dollar. The euro is down 6% <laughs> It's the US dollar. Okay. And what is up? The Russian ruble is up 12%. <laughs> yep. you know? And the people over the last 10 years, the big short has always been the Hong Kong dollar or the Chinese currency. They have weakened a little bit recently, but more because of the weakness of the yen than anything else. But I believe we are, again, as I said to you, there's this shift in the balance of economic power in the world. I also think that uh, the dollar standard is coming to an end. Again, it will be resisted for a long time. And part of the resistance is, of course, that uh, the countries outside the alliance, Europe, the US, Australia, Canada, the UK, these countries outside the alliance, they don't trust each other very much. <laughs> so, but basically, India can trade with Russia and avoid the SWIFT system. They can settle outside the SWIFT system and they can uh, settle their trade outside the dollar area. And the same can happen with China. So I think the US dollar as a global currency will probably come to an end the way the British pound came to an end around or after the First World War. And this is a very important development because the US had uh, huge advantages by having a world currency, huge. But that is probably coming to an end. And so we are the, in this very exciting time and young people say to me, well, you were lucky you came to Asia, you know, in 1973 and it wasn't developed and so forth. I say, no, today it's more developed, but there are more opportunities. You know, Absolutely. still so many regions. If you look at India, there's so many areas in India that have not yet been developed, that can be developed. There are so many areas in um, Myanmar that can be developed and so forth. So there's a huge potential everywhere. No, absolutely. I think the, the biggest trend shift we have seen in India is, uh, of course, the private equity money coming both globally and domestically into the startup ecosystem. You know, the, the number of unicorns that we have created and the pipeline that I see uh, in the startup ecosystem. And, you know, they are, some of these people are actually creating and uh, solving the demand and supply equilibrium very well, which some of the larger companies and conglomerates cannot do. So you're absolutely right. You know, there is a bundle, bundle of opportunities, uh, you know, in India. Uh, and, you know, the way I look at it, I think this decade could be India's decade. Uh, you know, we have talked about that internally a lot. And, you know, I, I actually take a page out of your book, you know, Tomorrow's Gold, where you talked about the big picture themes that you foresaw uh, coming to Asia and, you know, uh, as early as 2000. And, uh, you know, we saw emerging markets had an extremely lucrative golden phase from 2003 to 2008. And then, of course, the GFC happened. And then the last decade, Mark, if I look at it, I think, you know, the, the developed markets kind of took the lead and the emerging markets have kind of fallen through the cracks. They have not lived up to the, I, I would say, the limelight or, you know, what people envisaged the EMs to be or the BRICs to be right uh, when that uh, coin was termed uh, the emerging market underperformance has actually taken us a bit surprised in the last decade but do you think with the commodities bouncing back do you think that this decade of you know the decade that we are in and you know two years into it do you think that emerging markets in asia and india in particular uh, you know is the one that's actually going to stand out or do you foresee that should central banks kind of, you know, go back on a dovish stance in the next nine months, 12 months, one year, that the outperformance of the US will continue. How do you see that in your mind? Because 
the more people I speak to, I think they it's it's kind of the writing is on the wall that this is Asia's decade. Well, uh, you raise a very important point that I wanted to also discuss very briefly. You know, when we talk about markets and the bubble and so forth, as I said earlier, because we have a bubble, many sectors have been neglected. In other words, the fund manager, he is not interested to buy a stock that is the best company and that is undervalued. He wants to buy a stock that is moving and outperforming the index. Absolutely. He buys a stock to beat his competitor, not the best company. Now, having done that for the last, uh, since 2009, now the US market is in the sky still, and the emerging markets are in the dust bin. <laughs> yes. Enough. Yep. Not India. India is highly priced. Yep. But if you look at India, there are some stocks that are very low and some stocks that are that essentially are the index, they're very high. So I think the Indian market could go down, the indices, but if you're in the right stocks, you may make a lot of money. And in Hong Kong today was a very interesting day. The market was down, but value stocks were all up. Value stocks in Hong Kong nowadays is property stocks. You know, like they sell at a 50% discount to asset value. Now you will say, yes, there's a reason for that. Everything is bad. Yes, everything is bad, but the market knows it. And still they're so cheap. So... I think there is an opportunity in emerging economies. I like uh, some assets in India. I like the resource companies. I think they're still reasonably priced. And I like uh, countries like Indonesia, very cheap, some companies. Malaysia, uh, Hong Kong, even Singapore has some inexpensive companies. And so forth. Latin America is very cheap. Any, I like anything that is not the Am America, <laughs> that is not <laughs> the US. <laughs> yeah, no. So I think it's very clear that, you know, my next thought process was to ask you a question on the value versus growth debate. And uh, it's very clear that you are probably on the value camp right now, given how much our performance growth has given in the last couple of years. Uh, and uh, would you collaborate that view as well? I have always been a value investor. I have okay. never bought, you know, high-flying stocks. I was always interested to buy things uh, that are inexpensive and look for opportunities that are neglected, which led me in the 1980s to buy emerging markets because nobody was looking at Argentina. Nobody was looking at Colombia. Nobody, you know, even India was not a popular market. I remember we started the India Fund, uh, John Sohn. He started it, I think, in 1994 or 1991, but it didn't move until... Uh, the boom in 1999, 2000, because he had a big position in Infosys. And then this, uh, the company developed. But for the first 10 years, the assets in the fund, can you believe that, were around 12 million US? This was the difficult time. Also, my friends who run the Dragon Fund in Vietnam, the first few years, they struggled. Nobody was interested. And as I say, nowadays, everybody's interested in the tech stocks in Silicon Valley and so forth. But the value stocks, there are lots of companies that are inexpensive, also in India. The real estate in the best location of Mumbai is very expensive, but maybe two hours away from Mumbai is not expensive. No, fair enough. So, uh, Mark, you know, another question that I have is the trend that picked up in COVID, right? I mean, we saw an influx of 
domestic retail investors coming in not only in india that we saw but also globally as well right it was a trend that uh, the retail participation went up uh, you know in the us with the robin hoods of the world the robin hood market cap went to 80 billion and as of you know last night i checked it was back down to almost you know 7 8 billion dollars so it's come <laughs> on a round trip but we have seen a tremendous tectonic shift in india right the long term impact of uh, you know the retail and the hni community in india that we have seen has has continued right you know uh, foreigners have been selling in india for the last 6 months but the retail community has been holding it up and we have absorbed all that supply um my question to you is that in your experience of trading em countries for the last two decades right yes. what is your uh, you know experience that when the domestic flow of money starts coming into economy you know and that has been quite serious enough for india right does that mean that there has been a tectonic shift uh, are we a, a, are we about to enter uh, the new leg where you know in india we keep, we keep talking about the financialization of savings uh, moving from bank deposits into the equity markets um, and i think that you know that trend will probably continue for the foreseeable future but and we talk a lot about that in the domestic circles right i would love to hear your thoughts uh, you know from a foreign perspective as to how you view that how you view that in other em economies as well in the past again this is a very good question and uh, there's no kind of universal answer because if you look say at germany post toward germany 1947 to say 1980 i can say that this was probably the most successful economic expansion both in terms of rising wages and of uh, rising standards of living and of producing high quality goods you know whatever you tell me still today the best quality cars are bmws and uh, mercedeses and so the germans they have a lot of industries that produce quality by the way also german uh, switzerland now a lot of these companies they're basically private companies maybe they have shares outstanding but the companies uh, controlled by the family or two or three families and so the german capital market never developed to the extent that the us capital market has developed it never became kind of a financialized economy on the other hand you look at hong kong singapore the market capitalization is a multiple of the economy so it's a very important part the financial market is kind of their industry so different countries have different approaches i think in india uh, we still have many groups that are privately owned as you know indian industry is in general very fragmented extremely fragmented so a lot of consolidation can take place and will take place and of course the financial market will grow but i wanted to say uh, what we could have in india is that the index which has performed so well over the last say 3 4 years that this index could come down quite meaningfully because the valuation of the best companies where you talk uh, nestle or what not they could come down a lot especially if interest rates go up fair enough and you know foreigners they go into a market and then things uh, this i wanted i explained in a report if you have weakness in meme stocks like gamestop and amc and the nasdaq and if you have this weakness uh, and the system is very leveraged in america the margin debt is at an all time high but it's not only leverage through margin debt which you can measure but also through bank loans and so forth credit cards and and then then anyway when the margin calls go out the guy he has to meet the margin call uh, so a margin call could go out in a stock account but the client he may own bitcoins 
and instead of selling the stocks, he may sell bitcoins. So it's very interesting. In the US, the correlation between NASDAQ 100 and Bitcoin has never been as high as in the last six months. Uh, the NASDAQ 100 peaked on November 22, uh, 2021, in other words, six months ago, and Bitcoin peaked out 10 days later. And since then, both of them are down more than 40%. Oh, very cool. So I, I'd say that if the US market weakened considerably, as I think it will. I think it will have an impact on the market value in India as well. Yep, no, absolutely. We haven't decoupled, that's for sure. Uh, I've also opened the forum for questions, uh, Mark, and there's a very interesting question that's come in. Uh, you know, the question that's come from Vipul is, what's the one big trend Mark sees in India for the next decade in which he will invest in? And more importantly, also asked, what's one trend which you will not invest in? So is it, uh, you know, I mean, I guess the high growth stocks uh, is probably the one trend that I see from your conversation, but anything else that comes into your, into your picture as well? Well, uh, in general, and I have a lot of US dollars because, uh, you know, I have stock positions that are valued in US dollars and have US dollar cash and have bonds in US dollars and so forth. But I really feel we have to move out of US dollars. Now the question is today or tomorrow and so forth, and into what? Because if you move into Euro, you basically may be even worse off. You understand? So I have, my belief is very strongly that I want to have most of my assets in Asia, not in the US. And by definition, if I don't have them in the US, I shouldn't have them essentially in Europe, and I shouldn't have them in Australia, <laughs> in Canada. <laughs> you understand? You yeah. have to diversify the jurisdiction. <laughs> Say, if I'm a Russian oligarch, I'd rather have my yacht in uh, Goa okay. <laughs> than in, in France or Germany. <laughs> oh, well said, absolutely. So, but, but, you know, like, so that, but the trend I see, I mean, I, I really feel we could be at the period of massive wealth destruction. You know, where for the first time, uh, in the history of the Western capitalistic age, which started, say, around 1820, and now we are at the late stage of that uh, capitalistic age, we will have a period where young people will live uh, standards of lives that are much worse than their parents. It's already obvious statistically they earn less and they have less money. My daughter, at the age of 35, she has less than I had at 35, and she earns less, partly because she doesn't want to work, but that's another story. <laughs> that's, <laughs> the, that's the Vogue culture. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we were born a generation. We actually enjoyed the work. You know, it's like, uh, I think uh, you shouldn't approach work as a victim that you have to. You should go into your job because you're interested to do something and you should be thankful to God, whoever God is for you, that you have the opportunity to work and to learn something. That is the right attitude. And this should be the attitude uh, of everyone in whatever you do, that you do something as well as possible. Now, I believe this generation has been brainwashed by the socialists uh, to say this and that, and they, the rich people are bad, and this is horrible in the Western world what the teaching, uh, teaching establishment has done with the children. And therefore, I want to have my money in Asia. I still have in Europe because I'm born in Switzerland and I still have some assets in Switzerland. 
And I say I move everything to Asia over time. And I think in this period of uncertainty, and we also have to see, I mean, I grew up, I was taught at school and at university of everywhere, oh, democracy is the best because you are free. What did the Democrats do in Canada? They locked down. And where is the freedom? Can't even go out of your house to have a smoke. This is the freedom that they broadcasted. Democracy has given rise to authoritarian regimes in Australia, US, Europe, and so forth. In Germany, they're still debating about imposing that uh, vaccination is mandatory. Right. In other words, you must get the vaccine. Otherwise, you exclude it from society. Never in history has this happened. This is no. democracy. It's all BS. So my view is, uh, you know, a lot of people will be very disappointed. And this whole ESG investment is another thing. It will increase the cost of everyone doing business. You know, in economics, as a corporation, your responsibility is to make a profit. Of course, you have a social responsibility, but it shouldn't be imposed on you by some accountant and some consultants that come from the US and teach you about cancel culture BS. No, we are getting pearls of wisdom as well. Thanks for that, Mark. Yeah, uh, there's sure. another... in India you will get it. But luckily, and I have to say this about India, despite the fact that I think the market will go lower, you have the best government you ever had. You have had the best central bank of anyone uh, in the world over the last 50 years. Uh, Rajan was a great central banker and his successors as well, because they pay attention to asset values. They pay attention to does the economy overheat? Uh, they are aware the most important for Indian prosperity, for the masses, for the people, is stability of the exchange rate. Very well said. Mark, I know we are running out of time. This is, uh, I'm just going to short one more question at you. Uh, the question that's come in is your current views on gold as an asset class. You know, as I mentioned earlier as well, I think uh, it has been a disappointing to see gold lag despite the trillions printed by central banks. Has gold lost its shine in the global portfolio or will it make its comeback soon? So, and what is your current view on that? Well, my current view is uh, <coughs> when I started to work in 1970, the price of gold was $35 an ounce, okay? Then in the uh, 70s, it went up to a peak of $850 in uh, January 1980. At that time, it was a bubble. And the bubble deflated and gold traded in the mid-80s to the end of the 1990s at between, say, $250 uh, to $400. Average price, say, around $320. So in 1999, gold is still at $255 at its low. And now it is at uh, close to $1,900. It is not performing as well as if you had invested in, say, Sun Pharmaceutical or in uh, Infosys or Asian Paint and so forth. That we all agree. But it's been a safe uh, store of value. And I recommend every Indian family and every Indian uh, individual to hold some of his funds in gold. Physical, not stored with the Federal Reserve in America. That will steal it from you. Fair enough. Well, in Martin, your cellar. Yep. <laughs> under yep. your bed. But don't tell your wife or girlfriends where it is. <laughs> Well, luckily in India, you know, we are fascinated with gold. So most of the gold is in physical form as well. 
so that's a good thing. Uh, Mark, we have come to an end of our you know long discussion. Uh, I really want to thank you for your lovely insights and thoughts. It's been an absolute pleasure and privilege for me in particular. And uh, there are surely <laughs> no, no, there are sure. Sorry, every discussion with anyone in the world is a privilege uh, because you can always learn something. I've learned something from you, and I have to say, since I went to India the first time in 1973, most of your viewers were not even born. I've learned a lot about India, and I realized, you know, we people in the Western world, we've had that school hours and hours for 10 years about Swiss history and French history and so forth. We knew practically nothing about Indian history. And I'm lucky I have a friend, he's Indian, but he lives in Nepal, and he's a good teacher for me in Indian history and also Indian culture. And I went several times to India, to southern India, to Rajasthan several times and so forth. I mean, it's a very fascinating history, but nobody knows anything about it. And even Indians don't know how rich and successful their country was. You know, oh, this was a, a, a nation of architects and engineers. They built Borobudur in Indonesia. They built Angkor Wat in uh, Cambodia. These people... They never realize. If you go to, if an American goes to Cambodia and Angkor Wat and Vietnam, they all talk about the Chinese influence and so forth. But actually, the influence originally before the Chinese were Indian. No, absolutely. We are still creating, you know, most of the top CEOs in Silicon Valley are Indians. So yeah, they may yeah. be first yes. something. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we take a lot of pride in our culture. So thanks for highlighting that as well. And uh, Mark, honestly, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for being generous with your time. Well, and I do wish everyone joining and listening to us. Uh, thanks for insights. It is going to be a roller coaster year. It is going to be a little bit of boom and doom, but let's hope for the gloom at the end of it as well. Yes. So, thank you so much. And thank you. You have a Swiss name, Edelweiss. It's a <laughs> yes. It's a, thank it's you. The rarity. It's yes. The rarity. Thank you. Thank well, you, Mark. Me. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you Bye so much. much. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, guys. Hope that was insightful. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye.